Managing the land and tribal title system and overseeing national registries ranging from births and deaths to marriages, companies, incorporated societies, and personal property securities. Prior to his current position, Tamato served as the CEO of the Cook Islands Financial Services Development Authority from 2015 to 2018, where he demonstrated leadership in the financial sector. With a diverse professional background that includes roles as a legal counsel in offshore finance, deputy prosecuting attorney in Honolulu, and experience in the IT industry, Tamato's legal expertise extends to both the state of Hawaii, USA, and the Cook Islands. He holds a Juris Doctor from the University of Hawaii, a Law Certificate in Pacific and Asian Legal Studies, a Graduate Certificate in Conflict Resolution from the Matsunaga Institute for Peace, and a Bachelor of Science in Information Systems and Political Science from Brigham Young University, Hawaii. Tamato is statutorily appointed as the Registrar General of Births, Deaths and Marriages under the Birth and Deaths Registration Act 1973 and Marriages Act 1973, and as the Chief Registrar of Electors under the, Elect the Electoral Act 2004. Tamato also served a mission in Taiwan, Taipei, Chinese Mandarin speaking, and is the former district president of the Cook Islands, part of the Auckland, New Zealand mission of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He also served on the Cook Islands National Interfaith Religious Organization called the Religious Advisory Council from 2022 until handing the reins over to the new district president just last month. We welcome Tom Atoll. It's also my pleasure to introduce Honorable Moalai Bao Pepe Sayuli, who's the acting ombudsman for Samoa. Uh, Moalai Bao Sayuli joined the office of the ombudsman in 1992, when it established at the old Fono House of Parliament. In his role, he collaborates with the ombudsman in conducting investigations against government ministries and agencies, addressing complaints from the public related to matters of defective administration. Moa Laibao assumes a crucial role in the overall administration of the office, ensuring its effective and efficient operations. Before joining the office of the ombudsman, he held a position at the Office of the Public Service Commission, serving as the Chief Management Advisory Officer. In this capacity, he dealt with public service appeal matters, functioning as an advocate of the Commission in appeals involving non-promotions, appointments, and disciplinary matters. His previous experience includes serving as a Senior Executive Officer for the Inland Revenue Department. Moa Lai Bao's extensive background reflects his commitment to public service and his active involvement in addressing administrative grievances within government agencies. It's my pleasure to welcome both, and Tamato will begin um, with our presentation today. Distinguished delegates, um, conference organizers and participants, brothers and sisters, kia ora and aloha. aloha. It's my uh, sincere pleasure and privilege to be with you today. Um, and maybe before I begin, I just want to remark on what appears to be a coincidence. Um, my name is Tomatoa, and sometimes I have to kind of introduce or help explain how to pronounce my name. And what often comes up is that Disney film called Moana. <laughs> and we just so happen to have a lovely, passionate Moana with us. <laughs> a very statuesque Samoan that, that would remind us of Maui. And Tamatoa, who was pictured as a bottom-feeding, shiny, loving crustacean. 
I think they got that wrong. Um, but in, in all honesty, uh, you know, sometimes societies don't get things right. Uh, they look at other places and they try to fit a box in an island that might be diamond shaped. So the approach I am going to be taking today is focusing less on the human dignity part and looking more at the contextual part. So I'd like us all to get to know a bit more about the Cook Islands so that we can look through that perspective a bit more. So what I'll be looking at is um, a lot about the Cook Islands, geography, trade, demographics, history, government, culture, religion, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the issues if we have time. I kind of wanted to highlight a quote that I, I, I like. It's from Eleanor Roosevelt. She said, where after all do universal human rights begin? in small places, close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. And sometimes I think about the Cook Islands. Such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity, without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning uh, there, they have little meaning anywhere. So with that, I wanna dive into Cook Islands, looking at geography. So the top map shows uh, what has traditionally been presented in, in the past as the Polynesian Triangle, which begins with Hawaii in the north, and New Zealand in the east, and Easter Island in, sorry, Easter Island in the east, New Zealand in the west. Uh, and so I like to describe the Cook Islands as the center of that triangle, or, or well, I like to say the heart of Polynesia. Um, my, my other delegate may have a different opinion. Um, so just looking at the second map, you, it, it kind of talks about where the direct flights are, that's where the, the pink lines are. There is now a direct flight with Hawaii to the Cook Islands, about six and a half hours. Um, and in the white portion, you will see that there are 15 islands in total in the Cook Islands, and they're divided into a northern group and a southern group and all the land area combined of those islands total about 236 square kilometers, which is less than a sixth the size of Oahu. So that's a, a very small amount of land. But if you look at the ocean area, there's roughly about two million square kilometers, which is more than three times the size of the state of Texas. So very large ocean. And just to contextualize it, for the United States, the smallest state is Rhode Island, uh, and so our land mass is less than 8% the size of Rhode Island. But our ocean is more than 100% the size of Alaska. So our, our prior and current prime minister likes to refer to us as a large ocean state rather than a small island state. So to give some um, comparison here, the north is mostly made up of atolls. And so you see uh, a ring of land, a strip of land around, and a big lagoon in the middle. Uh, the top one is the, the atoll or island of Pukapuka, which is uh, very diverse and probably one of the most diverse cultures within the Cook Island culture. And then we have the island of Palmerston, uh, which I believe might only have a population of about 25 people. And then uh, another atoll, which is found in the top right, you'll kind of see uh, how small or short that land strip really is. You have the ocean on one side and a big <coughs> lagoon on the other. And in between there might be one road, if there's a road, and a couple houses. And compare that to the southern group, which is more volcanic in origin. So the main island of Rarotonga, um, you, you can see there's no lagoon in the middle. Uh, it's all land mass. Uh, Aichitaki is volcanic. It's one of the gems of the Pacific. I think there's only two like it in the world where it's actually volcanic in origin, but it does have a large lagoon in, in the middle. Um, and so just to kind of showcase a little bit more, this is Aichitaki, all these pictures. You'll see in the center there, um, there's, right there, there's a small island that's called One Foot Island. And uh, there's a bit of a story about this island, and, and there's a legend behind it, which uh, 
you know, it attracts a lot of attention. And it's a legend about a father and a son that were being chased by some warriors. And the father decided he was going to sacrifice himself for his son. And so he had his son run in front of him and he would run behind him and step on his footprints. And at one point he threw his son up to a coconut tree and crept running. And the warriors chased the father and the father gave his life for his son. And so from that story, we also find some cultural and some spiritual significance where the, when we relate it to the gospel of Jesus Christ, um, you know, Jesus sacrificed himself for us and through his, he carved him, us on his own footprints. So we, we sometimes see some symbolism in the gospel and in culture in the Cook Islands. Uh, compared to Rarotonga, landlocked, there's still a lagoon outside uh, that landmass, and a couple what we call motus, or little islets, that, that's there. On the far left-hand side, you'll see, uh, that's a picture I took as we're landing through the airport. Um, you know, the houses are not, you know, huts or thatch roof. Um, you have brick houses, uh, wooden houses. It's a very beautiful, uh, wonderful place to go to. So maybe after this presentation, we can all book a flight together. <laughs> so a little bit uh, information on trade, uh, tourism, more than 70% of GDP uh, is tourism for the Cook Islands. We have agriculture, we export some fruit, vanilla, uh, taro, uh, papaya. We have a black pearl industry. The black pearls are mainly grown up in the northern atolls. They have the lagoons to support it. Fishing, we got game fishing. We also have some fishing done by a lot of the bigger countries, Korea, Japan, etc. And we also have an offshore finance industry that started in the late 1970s, early 1980s, um, and actually has been quite influential in the offshore industry around the world. Um, it created um, some leading legislation relating to the Modern Asset Protection Trust that a lot of other jurisdictions have decided was a good thing and adopted into their legislation, I think including Samoa, and they've done very well with that. Um, we also use our own currency, um, but the valuation of the currency is tied to the New Zealand dollar, uh, which I believe is roughly about 0 0.6, 0 0.62 at the moment. So the, if you go to the Cook Islands with US currency, it's, it's worth a lot more than, um, than a one-to-one -one ratio. I want to spend a bit more time on this slide, demographics, looking particularly at the population. According to a 2021 census, our resident population was roughly around 15,000 people. And so that's, that's a small amount of people. Um, I think I was in Utah just, uh, just last week, and I think BYU Provo has, what, 30, 40,000 students? Yeah, that's, that's more than the population of our entire country. Um, but we have a large diaspora. In New Zealand, uh, in the 2018 New Zealand census, those who identified themselves as Cook Islanders were over 80,000. And that was about six years ago. They've recently had another census, and I, I believe that based on uh, prior census, that projection would be about 100,000, if not more. And that's with just self-identifying Cook Islanders. Um, in Australia, uh, self-identifying, uh, I estimate there's over 30,000. In the 2019 Australia census, there's about 28,000 that self-identified as Cook Islander. And I believe their census only required, or only allowed you to uh, self-identify with one, one or two different races. Um, there is a trans-Tasman travel arrangement that was established in 1973 between New Zealand and Australia. And what that did was it allowed New Zealand citizens to be able to travel to Australia and live and work without having to have Australian citizenship. Because the Cook Islands is part of the New Zealand realm, we also benefit from New Zealand citizenship. So as a result, um, we love to travel. We go to New Zealand. Sometimes we don't come back from New Zealand. Sometimes we go to Australia and we don't return as well. And that's the reason why there's a large diaspora. It's because of our New Zealand citizenship. 
In the Cook Islands itself, there's roughly an equal number of um, ratio between the genders. Uh, over, just over 7,000 males, a little bit more females. Uh, but most of the population lives in the southern group. Of the 15,000, there's about 13,900 of, of us in the southern group islands. And just over 1,000 live in the northern group. So you can see that most of the population is in the southern group, and a large portion of that is in the main island of Rarotonga. A little bit more about our history. Um, there, there was a time pre-European contact. A lot of people have different uh, theories on what happened, who went where first, who came from where. Uh, there's talk about seven great canoes. Uh, it's my personal belief that the word that was used for seven actually meant many in our Maori language. So there was more than seven. And we traveled back and forth. The oceans were viewed as highways rather than obstacles. And so there was free movement. We like to move our vacas. In fact, we have legends where people came from elsewhere, conquered particular islands. At one point, I think we went to our neighbors in Samoa to come and help us reconquer one of the islands. So there was a lot of movement that happened. In 1888, we became a British protectorate. And, and I want to kind of convey a bit of a story there. If, if you look on a, on a map, you'll see French Polynesia to our east. There is a story um, that I believe uh, actually stopped French expansionism. Um, and it, the Cook Islands stopped it. The French Navy fleet was going around the Pacific and pretty much putting their flag in and saying, all right, you are now part of the the, the French territory. Um, the Cook Islanders at the time didn't like what was happening. And so they actually approached Britain and said, well, we'd rather be with you. Can, can you take us on? And the funny thing is Britain said no. Um, but Cook Islanders at that time had two British flags. And so when the French Navy fleet came, they planted a British flag there. The French said, oh, the British are already here. We'll move on to the next island. Meanwhile, the other flag was waiting to see which island they would go to. And so the, the genius of the Cook Islands at that time stopped French expansionism. Um, after that, they approached the British again, and the British said, OK, we'll take you on. So uh, our experience in the Cook Islands is not necessarily quite like other Pacific islands. We, we freely wanted to become part of the British Empire uh, based on our choice. Then in 1901, the British decided to transfer the administration of the Cook Islands to New Zealand. Uh, the Cook Islands was organized as a one political entity around about 1915. There's a Cook Islands Act 1915 that helped set that up. And then on the 4th of August 1965, we, we passed our constitution and entered a relationship we call free association with New Zealand. And, and I like to poke fun at my Singaporean friends sometimes. Their Independence Day is the 9th of August. So we became independent before they did. Um, but you know that conversation doesn't go anywhere, really. <laughs> uh, in 1973, we had an airport on the main island of Rautonga. As a result, that opened up the opportunity to travel New Zealand. And so our population started um, decreasing since then, and we've had a continuing depopulation issue since that time. And then in 2001, there was a joint centenary declaration with New Zealand and the Cook Islands, and that was 100 years after the, uh, the Cook Islands became administered by New Zealand. And what that declaration did was it uh, reconfirmed um, the Cook Islands' ability and the New Zealand ability to enter into diplomatic relations and, and control its own foreign relations. However, we still retained a right to uh, ask the New Zealand government for military aid if, if ever needed. All right, um, I'm gonna try and speed through the next couple of slides here. So the Cook Island government has a head of state. The King's representative, Sir Tom Masters, is a picture of him on the top. He's a representative of the King of England. And so that is our head of state. We have a Westminster system of government governed by a cabinet and a prime minister commanding a majority of parliament which has 24 members. We also have a judiciary which is comprised of the high court divided into land court, 
criminal and civil court. And we also have a court of appeal. And we currently still have the Privy Council as our ultimate court of appeal, which uh, New Zealand and Australia have already done with, done away with. But some of us still like to go to London for some reason. Um, our judges are actually all qualified New Zealand judges. So we kind of borrow them, and they're very high caliber, King's Council level, uh, a joy to work with. And our discussion with them is when we appoint you to the Cook Island Bar, to the Cook Island Court, you are Cook Island judges when you're in the Cook Islands. And so um, we love those judges. We have uh, formal diplomatic relations with more than 50 countries. It started with Norway in 1991, China in 1997, and the US came on board last year. So that was good to see. We have a high commission, the main offices in New Zealand, which uh, represents the Cook Islands to Australia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, and we just recently set up a high commission in Fiji. Uh, we are also signatories to several international treaties, conventions, UNCLOSE, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, and also three of the human rights related treaties, uh, Convention Rights of a Child, CEDAR, and the, <coughs> the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, government, there's 14 main ministries. The Ministry of Justice is one of them. The most recent one was created, Ministry of Corrective Services. Uh, when I came on board, we moved two of my departments and decided to create a new ministry with those two, probation and prison. So I was happy when that happened, less, less to deal with. Uh, but you see we have a number of other statutory and crown agencies, a number of state-owned enterprises, and offices that support the six ministers of cabinet. We have a very vibrant culture. Um, the top picture is a picture of one of my sons in his school performance. And they are, they are full on in, um, big performances, the whole community comes out to. And in the middle bottom, uh, that's actually a picture of um, a team that went and performed in Japan for several years on Namagawa Island. And the center person that's drumming is my father. And in the bottom right, you'll see that's a Cook Island team that came and performed at the PCC a couple times. Um, on the top right, my father launched a couple books relating to culture. He tried to preserve as much as possible songs, chants, uh, legends, history. And in the top left, um, this is an old record of a group called the Pacific Panorama. And uh, the Pacific Panorama, Panorama was a group that B the old BYU Hawaii put together before PCC came into place. And in the top left-hand corner, you probably can't see it, there is a Rarotonga section that performed um, a song called Na Puariki, which I understand was composed by my grandfather. And so the Cook Island culture was being performed here in Hawaii before PCC even came about. The center I want to highlight is um, what I call the, the ensemble, the drum ensemble. You have the wooden pate, the slit gongs that came from the west. And then you also have some skin drums that came from the east. And they met in the Cook Islands and they fused and they created that ensemble. So whenever you see those instruments together, that is Cook Island culture, Cook Island artifacts. We have a house of Ariki. Uh, they're made of members of uh, the traditional chiefs. Um, they look after the welfare of the people. Uh, and they are part of what we call the three pillars of society, government, religion, and our traditional leaders, House of Ariki. I'll talk a bit about religion. Um, Christianity arrived in 1821. We refer to a Christian heritage in the preamble to our Cook Islands uh, constitution. In our constitution and other legislations, we, we use the phrase, so help me God, in part of our oaths, uh, which is a form of prayer. Prayers are regularly said in official government meetings. Um, in fact, we take the approach that instead of not praying for the sake of the one, we'd rather pray for the sake of the 99. So prayers are always said in all meetings. Um, in fact, the Religious Advisory Council does the opening prayer devotion in all cabinet meetings, which is held weekly and also in parliament. Uh, the majority of the population is religious. The Religious Advisory Council is, has six main members, the Cook Island Christian Church, 
which is uh, the remnants of the London Missionary Society that uh, did missionary work in the Pacific. Uh, Seventh-day Adventist, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Assembly of God, Apostolic, and Catholic. And they do a lot of uh, interfaith joint initiatives. Uh, and there are other religions on the island, Jehovah's Witness, Baha'i Faith, uh, Celebration on the Rock. There is a piece of legislation called the Cook Islands Religious Organizations Restriction Act, 1975, which is administered by the Ministry of Justice. It restricts public assembly of any religious organization unless approved by the Minister of Justice. But there was an amendment that was put in that said the minister cannot withhold approval unless establishment would be contrary to local customs and practices, public safety, order or morals, or the general welfare or security of the Cook Islands. Now that's a bit of a key phrase that's also included um, in the Constitution. Article 64 is where you find a lot of the human rights. And you'll see at the very bottom there, um, it says, it is hereby recognized and declared that every person has duties to others and accordingly is subject in the exercise of his rights and freedoms to such limitations as are imposed uh, by any enactment or rule of law for the time being in force for protecting the rights and freedoms of others or in the interest of public safety, order or morals, and general welfare or the security of the Cook Islands, which is the same wording that's inside um, that other act. So I'll just quickly talk about a, a couple issues here. Uh, last year, uh, we amended our Crimes Act, uh, which was a long time coming, where we decriminalized homosexuality. There's an interesting story there, but I don't think I have the time to get into that. Uh, but our Marriage Act 1973 still prohibits same-sex marriage. Uh, there is issues of legislative creep coming from New Zealand because part of our legislative process is to have drafters that are from the Parliamentary Council Office in New Zealand. We have a changing society combined with depopulation, large diaspora. We also have increasing foreign workers, which presents other interesting changes that we project might happen. Land is not sold fee simple. It is based on your genealogical connection to indigenous Cook Islanders, which presents an interesting uh, side of things as well in, in society. There is challenges with distance in the outer islands. Um, we cannot always get to the outer islands. There's remote things that happen. Pop, small populations, 25 people. Um, there's, there's a, I won't get into that story. I'll save that for a, a later. Uh, climate change, competing priorities, limited resources. Uh, these are all issues that impact our ability uh, to do better in educating and letting people know about human, human dignity. Um, two, two or three other things I wanted to point out. Um, currently, we require Cook Islanders to put stamps in their passports. The Cook Islanders doesn't give passports, so we rely on other countries' passports uh, for, for traveling. Uh, but we require Cook Islanders to put a stamp in there proving that they are Cook Islanders, which does present a bit of an issue in terms of Article 13.2 of the Human Rights Declaration. Everyone has the right to leave any country, including his own, and to return to his country. So sometimes when Cook Islanders don't have the stamp in the passport, our immigration officers give them a really hard time, which they, they shouldn't be. We also have a 2008 Disability Act, uh, which has been slow for us to implement. In fact, the Ministry of Justice, which has two floors and only stairs, just, just last year put in the first elevator in the Cook Islands, so now there's no not as much access, access to justice or access to public service issues there. Uh, hopefully more elevators are installed with, with larger buildings that are there. And last, I just want to point out cultural identity is an issue. Um, you know, misappropriation of, of culture, cultural rights is indispensable to our dignity. Uh, if you look at uh, that snapshot I took of, um, I think it's a Pinterest account, it has a picture of dancers, and it labels it as Cook Islands, and then it has sub-labels as Tahitian dancers. So, um, you know, this is kind of, um, you, you could say it's similar to what's happening with, uh, what, you know, the, the word tamatoa, and associating with a bottom-feeding crustacean, rather than the warrior chief, chieftain known in many Polynesian societies. There's this globalization or homogenization 
of our identity, which impacts our communal identity um, in, our, in our Pacific Island countries. And with that, thank you very much. I, I appreciate your time and apologies to the timekeepers. <laughs>
Foremost, human dignity is understood as part of Samoa's international obligation. Samoa only agrees to be bound to a human rights treaty or convention when it is satisfied that its domestic laws are compliant and that the local context is suitable and appropriate for a practical application of such human rights instrument. As a member of the United Nations, Samoa accepts the provisions of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Charter. The concept of human dignity is present in the preamble of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, which declares that recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of human family is the very foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Additionally, under Article 1 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, it is declared that all human beings are born free and equal in dig dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and, sh and should act towards one another in the spirit of brotherhood. To date, Samoa is party to six of the nine core human rights conventions. They are as follows. For those who have my paper, I have listed down six conventions. Domestically, human dignity and human rights are enshrined in the constitution of the independent state of Samoa and under various mandates of the executive branch, it is also realized as a mandate of the Ombudsman's office. Two, as a mandate of the Ombudsman. The Ombudsman is an independent officer of Parliament appointed by the Head of State on the recommendation of Parliament for a term of six years. It is independent from government interference. The office was established under the Comsino Sulfa Act 1988 with just a conventional function of in investigating administrative decisions or acts of government ministries and certain other organizations. In 2013, the Ombudsman's mandate extended to include that of human rights and special investigations and was continued under the Ombudsman Act 2013. With the additional role of human rights, the Ombudsman has become Samoa's National Human Rights Institute. The objective of the role of the Ombudsman is clear and twofold as follows. One, A, to promote transparency, accountability, and integrity in the administration and decision of ministries and organizations. That is more or less protection of rights of the individuals. Two, or B, to promote and protect the dignity of humankind <coughs> enshrined in the Constitution, international human rights law as the foundation of a fair, just, and peaceful society. There are a myriad of ways in which the Ombudsman is lawfully obligated to promote and protect the dignity of humankind as specified under Section 33 of the Ombudsman Act. This also includes the annual State of Human Rights Report that is to be issued to the government before 30th of June every year. This report is to, be, is to include recommendations about reforms and other measures, whether legal, political, or administrative, which could be taken to prevent or redress human rights violations. This report also should include observations on the progress of any action taken by the government on previous reports. This is tabled to the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly, who passes it to the Parliamentary Committee responsible for human rights to consider, call evidence, and respond. Since its inception, the Ombudsman has issued eight status of human rights reports to Parliament for consideration. At the international level, the Ombudsman, as Samoa's National Human Rights Institute, is subject to international standards known as the Paris Principles for all national human rights institutes. As such, NHRI compliance with the Paris Principles is assessed by the Global Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions, known as the GANRI, Subcommittee on Accreditation, through a rigorous periodic uh, accreditation process, the Ombudsman's office was accredited as an A-status institution in 2016 and again in 2021, the highest possible ranking for National Human Rights Institute. To date, Samoa's Ombudsman
remains as the only Pacific Island National Human Rights Institute with a ranking apart from New Zealand and Australia in the South Pacific region. On paper, Samoa can be reverent as open and fully immersive in human rights and human dignity. However, from a cultural perspective, it can be argued that this is not entirely the case. There was a lot of pushback from the village communities in response to the ombudsman's efforts to promote human rights at the outset. It was viewed as another modern, modern and foreign concept imposed on Samoa that had no place in her tradition and culture. Three, from a Samoan traditional and cultural perspective, or a Tangata or a human being was considered divine in ancient and pre-Christian Samoa, it is believed that every, everyone descended from the high god, Tangaloa Langi, who was believed to be the creator of heaven and earth. Tangaloa Langi would occasionally descend from the heavens to marry many beautiful girls, daughters of the land, and create divine heirs known as Suli, which is another literal translation meaning free in limited space. This belief meant that Samoans rendered respect and dignity to all human life, regardless of sex. Essentially, human dignity is inherent in Samoan culture. There are, however, certain taboo or restrictions in special relationships between Samoans. This taboo are coupled with sacred covenants called Fianghenga, giving way to Tuaoi or boundaries. This is why there was understandably pushed back from the local communities to ombudsman awareness and promotion programs regarding human rights because there was fear of encroaching on these boundaries. For context, to Puatam Sesefi as an acclaimed Samoan author charges on three examples of such specialized special relationships in a Samoan cultural context, namely between a parent and a child, a brother and a sister, and the offender and the offended. The relationship between a parent and a child is a sacred one. Mother is the natural, while the father is the eye on the hand of instruction and example setting. Parents have the responsibility to raise and care for their children, while the children have the responsibility to obey, respect, and care for the parents. The observance of this sacred bond can lead to either blessings, famanuyanga, or curses, mala motua. With the promotion of rights of children in modern day Samoa, many parents have, report, have retorted that this has led to the delinquent and unruly behavior in the children who think they no longer have to abide by the cultural principles of these relationships with their parents. In response, the Ombudsman Office has explained that children's rights were designed specifically to protect their freedom as children, as they are a vulnerable group and therefore rely on others to protect them. Discipline, an essential part of child rearing in Samoa, is still acceptable provided it does not escalate to abuse, which is a violation of children's rights. The relationships between a brother and a sister has its own distinctive cultural features. Here, the Fianghainga is attributed as both a status and a covenant. In indigenous Samoa, the status of female highborn was called a Fianghainga. She was elevated in society due to her ability to reproduce and give life. In the family, the Fergainga were also known as Ilamutu or family gods, said to have shared their divine divinity with the gods. They were also renowned as family conciliators, forging peace between family members and villages during disputes. If the role of the Fergainga is re rejected, the case would be activated. With the promotion of rights of women in modern day Samoa, many have argued that this has led to the newfound independence and promiscuity in young women, stripping them of their mamalu or integrity as fairainga. In response, the office has explained that women are in fact a vulnerable group, subjected to numerous acts of violence. This is proven by the 
Ombudsman's public inquiry that was conducted on family violence in 2018, it was found out that the majority of women, six out of 10, have experienced intimate partner violence, and up to one in five women have experienced rape in their lifetime. In this, it is thus imperative that women are aware of their rights and the avenues that are available to them to identify, report, and address violence. Finally, the relationship between the offender and the offended. Justice in indigenous Samoa was facilitated by the village fono that consisted of high chiefs and orators. Penalties depended on the gravity or degree of seriousness of the offenses committed. They varied from the delegation of lab laborious tasks to the presentation of fresh produce or livestock. The more serious penalties involved public humiliation such as group beatings and being carried with one's legs and hands tied to a wooden bow like a pig, like an animal, and left out in an open area. This is to strip the offender temporarily of his dignity and making a, an example of him in an effort to deter similar and recurring offenses. Even more serious offenses such as murder and gross insolence included com complete deprivation of property through arson, punishment, and even life for life. Some of these penalties persist in modern day Samoa. With the promotion of human rights, some feel that these individual human rights have eroded the respect for village governance, as village foreign decisions can now be challenged in the lands and titles court. In response, the office has explained there should be no distinction between individual human rights and those of collective human rights, like village fono, for example. Communal rights are formed from individual human rights. They are complementary. Natural justice dictates that everyone has a right to answer and should be given a chance to. This is a prerequisite of good governance. The reality is that there will always be a gap between a full embrace of human rights and a cultural perspective in Samoa. There is a given as Samoan culture, traditions, customs embody the lifeblood that sustain the distinct identity of Samoan people. Instead of presenting human rights as a foreign concept, the tactic for the Samoan Ombudsman's Office has been to draw similarities between human rights and the principles that underpin the Samoan <coughs> culture, such as respect, love, and, and reciprocity. This is also reflected in the image of the Samoan Ombudsman as well. The Samoan Ombudsman logo was inspired by a Samoan legend about a cannibal king named Manietofenga. He was known to be a cruel king over pre-Christian Samoa that required the presentation of a young man wrapped in coconut leaves for his table every morning as a feast. It was said that Manietofenga had a son named Polio Ninganga. Polio Ninganga had heard the cries of his people and in an effort to put a stop to his father's cannibalistic uh, practice, he offered himself to be presented to his father's table. When Manietofenga discovered that it was his son wrapped in coconut leaves before him, he put a stop to the practice for good. Psalm 1 Ombudsman Loco shows a figure of a man extending a hand to another figure lying down below him, wrapped in coconut leaves. This is symbolic of the essence of the Ombudsman's office as a bridge between a government and the ordinary citizen, and a helping hand in the promotion and protection of human rights, all within the context of our own Samoan culture. Four, from a modern societal perspective. Over the years, the influx of other cultures for various reasons has influenced Samoan's history economy, population, health, education, and so forth. Regardless, the inherent respect for human dignity in Samoa remains constant. The first shipment of intended laborers in Samoa were Chinese laborers in 1903. During the German, German administration, there were 
they were recruited to work on plantations on restricted contracts for a certain period before they were shipped back to their country of origin. Soon enough, relationships between Samoan women and a Chinese men became increasingly common, irrespective of the fact that they were initially forbidden under the German and New Zealand administration. The Chinese completely assimilated into the Samoan way of life, influencing the food, business, landscape, and such. To date, the descendants of these Samoan Chinese relationships are some of the most prominent and highly respected members of Samoan society. On the other end of the spectrum, there is a new wave of Chinese businessmen, owners in modern day Samoa, which has conjured a mix of emotions. Increasingly, they have become targets for theft, burglary, and even bothering the description of hate crime. In 2020, a group of young Samoan men were trialed and convicted for the murder of a Chinese businessman in Samoa. Justice Fal Marole Lantuala Warren commented in a decision, Samoa as a nation pride themselves on being tolerant and accepting of different races and must guard this tolerance fiercely. She went on to say that as a country, we must be careful lest it become a country with hostility towards a group of patients who have the race in common. As accepting as Samoese as society to change, there are, however, notable gaps in human rights that indicate that Samoa is not yet ready and may never be ready as a society to fully accept. In the space of Chenta, for example, there are four recognized cultural centers in Samoa, female, male, Fafafine and Fafatama. Fafafine and Fafatama are fluid gender roles that move between male and female roles. They are formally accepted and recognized in Samoa with their own Samoan Fafafine Association, and are some of the most well-respected members <coughs> of the Samoan society due to their contributions in elderly care, fashion, education, and such. Despite this, Fafafine and Fafatama do not rec get recognition in policies and legislation. The Constitution does not explicitly <coughs> list gender identity or expression as protected characteristics. An Anana Crimes Act 2015, sodomy is still a crime. The stance for the Samoan government <coughs> in response to the recommendations by the UN Human Rights Council on the 39th <coughs> Universal Periodic Review of 2021 to decriminalize consensual sexual relations between adults of same, same sex and expand its anti-discrimination <coughs> legislation to more inclusive was a firm no. The Prime Minister cited Christian beliefs as the rationale which is also enshrined in the foundation for Samoa in Article 1 of the Constitution of the Independent State of Samoa. In the space of religion, freedom of religion is also enshrined in the Constitution in the Independent State of Samoa. <coughs> The right is subject to reasonable restrictions by law in the interest of national security, public order, morals, and in safeguarding the rights and the freedom of others. As of 2021, national census, it was recorded that the majority of population are Christian. Less than 16% of the population belong to other faiths, including a very small number of Hindus, Muslims, Jews, and Baha'i. Less than 1% do not volunteer a religion. Despite this, in some villages, there are certain protocols and regulations that forbid the establishment of new religion. Some community leaders have also reported there are a very strong societal pressure at the village level for villagers to participate in village activities and financial projects to, the, to support the operation of changes. Conclusion. Respect for human dignity is well and alive in Samoa. It is inherent in a culture, society, and through its laws and practices. This, however, does not fully translate to a full embrace of the plethora of universal human rights for very specific reasons that are attributed to the identity of Samoa as a people, a 
as a culture and as a country. From an ombudsman and a National Human Rights Institute perspective, this is to be expected, not just of Samoa, but of Oceania, who share a history of colonial rule that may be a contributing factor to the hesitation to fully embrace anything foreign to our ways. There is no one-size-fits-all category when it comes to human rights. Countries vary in government priorities, social issues and plights. What is more important is increasing accessibility, having a plethora of recognized platforms and avenues that allow for human rights to be fought in one's country. This can also be rationalized through understanding and encouraging the practices of respect for human dignity. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much to both panelists and your wonderful uh, presentations and sharing with us what is in the Cook Islands and in Samoa in regards to human dignity. We may have um, time for one question as we will finish at four o'clock. So if someone has a question, we do have a little bit of time. If you do have questions um, for either panelists, they are invite you to meet with them and ask them questions during the break. Um, we are going to break now until 4.05 um, and give time for the next session to set up. Um, so a five minute break, or a little bit longer, and then um, we invite you all back um, into this room.